Hey everyone and welcome, welcome to another episode of Cooking in Bridget's Healthy Kitchen. I hope you're well and I hope you are safe. Thank you for joining me. It is going to be a absolutely delicious class today. We're going to be making a very healthy version of loaded fries. So if you don't know what loaded fries are, they are basically french fries or chips, you know, ones that you either cook in, in hot fat or hot oil or cook in the oven, so you normally make from potatoes, and then you kind of load all these ingredients on top of them and make them quite delicious. Well, I'm going to be teaching you guys an absolutely healthy, healthy version of loaded fries. Number one thing is we won't be using potatoes because potatoes, as you guys know, they are very high in naturally occurring um, starch and sugars, so they will raise our blood glucose, they will spike our insulin, and those are all the things that we want to avoid, especially when we're living this wonderful, healthy, gut-healthy lifestyle. So we're going to be using every other vegetable but a potato, and I'm not even going to be using sweet potato. You won't see any carrot, you won't see any pumpkin. I'm going to be using vegetables and I suggest you don't go anywhere, you need to stay and watch this class because I'm going to teach you guys how to create vegetable chips or vegetable fries out of vegetables you probably never even thought of cooking in the oven before and they are all absolutely delicious and of course they're really good for us. But before we do that, before we do that, I'm also going to be teaching you guys how to make a very delicious, very creamy almond cheese sauce. So you're making a cheese sauce, you can have a dairy free option or not, or you can use a bit of dairy, I'll show you guys both. And then we're going to cook the most amazing vegetable fries to make our loaded fries. Lots of things to go on, to, on top of it to make it really delicious. Let's get into the recipe, come on down to my bench. We're going to be making the almond cheese sauce first. So come on down to my bench. I've got some wonderful ingredients, look at that sitting here. And look at this very cool board that I have them sitting on. My uncle made this board. He's very clever, isn't he? It's a round, look at that, it's a round board, just like that. And um, it looks like the waves of the ocean, which he knows I absolutely love. So anyway, our almond cheese sauce um, is the ingredients that we have here. And as I was saying to you guys, I'm gonna teach you how to make a, um, a normal, well, normal as in dairy version. So it's gonna have a bit of butter, a bit of cheese in it. But I'm also gonna teach you guys, I'll show you guys, the alternative, which is the dairy-free vegan version as well, just in case you need to go completely dairy-free for lactose reasons or in case you are vegan. So the first thing that you want to do, we're going to put a pot on here. I've got quite a, this is my sauce, this is my favorite sauce pot, by the way. I love making sauces in this pot. It is my favorite. And it's a bit heavy, which is what we need. You don't want a light, you know, thin metal pot because your sauce may burn and you want to avoid that. So put your pot onto the heat and we're going to start off with a medium temperature, so medium heat. Now the first thing that we want to think about, because as I was saying we're going to do a dairy version, we're going to do a vegan or a non-dairy version, decide what version you want to do. If you are doing a dairy version, you want to grab yourself up 50 grams, which is 1.7 ounces of grass-fed, ideally organic butter. That's the first thing, grass-fed butter. Also for our um, our version that has dairy, I will be using cheddar cheese, finely grated there. I've got a really good aged cheddar, which I'll talk about a bit more later. Um, and I will be putting about 100 grams, so 3.5 ounces of the cheese goes in there. But let's just say, I'm going to start, I'm doing the dairy version, so the, the butter's going in there to begin with. But let's just say you want to go completely dairy free, or you want to go actually vegan, then you want to choose something like this. Now this is a uh, no palm oil, plant-based vegetarian, vegan, basically butter or margarine, because <laughs> that's kind of what it is. And it's made with a bit of coconut oil and vegetable oil. You could use that same um, weight, 50 grams, 1.7 ounces. And then for the cheese, you could use something along those lines. This is a vegan cheese um, made with coconut oil and modified potato starch and all sorts of other things like that. And it's a cheddar flavor, so you could also use that. And then you're going completely dairy-free and you're going completely vegan. I, as I was saying, I'm going to make the dairy version today because one thing about having a bit of dairy, especially if it's quality dairy, not too much, is you can have it in your diet because it's actually pretty good for you. So don't be afraid. If you're using a grass-fed organic butter, don't be afraid of it. It's actually really good for our bodies. So um, once our butter's melted, I have 50 grams of gluten-free plain flour that we're putting in here. 
which is once again 1.7 ounces. And then while it's kind of bubbling away, you give it a bit of a stir. And yes, you're kind of making a white sauce, but you're making one without, well, definitely without cow's milk. Because one of the things about dairy is that, yes, grass-fed butter, a little bit of grass-fed butter in your diet is actually really good for you. It's a healthy fat. But um, when it comes to adding milk, which you would normally do if you're making a white sauce, you'd add milk. Now, cow's milk, cow's milk can still have quite a lot of lactose and can cause some, some various degrees of intolerances in people who can't handle milk. And also, too much milk in your diet, especially commercially produced milk, can have an inflammatory uh, reaction in your body as well. So you want to avoid that. So what I'm doing now is I'm just giving a bit of a stir. It's starting to bubble. And I'm just cooking it maybe for about 30 seconds. Remember, all done on medium heat. And the next thing I'm going to be adding is our almond milk. Now, when you're choosing an almond milk, please make sure that you choose one that is just basically almonds and water. Because there's a lot of almond milks out there that have all sorts of other nasty ingredients, including, you know, rice and uh, sugar and gluten and all sorts of crazy stuff, which, quite frankly, is not necessary. So I've chosen a almond milk that is just literally almonds and water, <laughs> which is fantastic. And you want to add in 450 mils, or 450 to 500 mils of our almond milk is going to go in. So measure it out. Make sure I've actually got the right measurement there. No, I haven't. <laughs> My scales were hanging off. All right. It's about that much. <laughs> oh, it's on the side. Here we go. 450. And I'm going to fill that up. That's about a pint, just under a pint of almond milk I'm going to be adding in. And so you want to start by putting in a little bit and giving it a bit of a stir. That's the first stage. Put in a little bit, get it a, bit, a little bit of stir. Can you see what's happening? It's almost like I'm making shoe pastry, if anyone's ever made shoe pastry before. And it's come back into a bit of a lump, which is exactly what we want to do. So remember, medium heat, a bit more almond milk goes in. You don't want to dump it all in at the same time. You want to slowly incorporate it. And in between each addition, you want to give it a bit of a stir. That's really, really important, because we want to have lump-free almond milk. If I was to, uh, almond custard, but it's not custard, it's sauce. If I was to add it all at the same time, we might get lumps and that wouldn't be very nice. So I'm adding it a little bit at a time. I'm stirring in between each addition just to make sure that it's coming together really nicely. I'm still doing it on that medium temperature because I don't want it to catch, I don't want it to burn as well. And what's happening, of course, is that you're beginning to create a very simple but very nice little sauce. So it's stirring away there. It literally looks like I'm making shoe pastry, which is what you make a clears out of. But I'm not. <laughs> I'm making I'm making sauce. So once you sort of got it to this point here, and I'm being a bit more gentle now, only because I don't want to splash up on my, my black clothing. But once it gets to sort of this point here, there is nothing stopping you from swapping out your wooden spoon and for, if I've got one, no I don't, yes I do, one of these, there's nothing stopping you from doing that as well. Once again you're going to prevent lumps from forming in your sauce which is um, definitely a big no-no. You want, you want this to be creamy don't we? We want a creamy sauce so the whisk can get, look at it, it's coming together lovely. A bit more of our almond milk goes in. Now that I've got my whisk, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit more confident to go a bit faster here as the milk begins to incorporate into the flour and into the butter. Now, as I'm making this, you guys have seen me making this, I just want to explain to you guys the reason, the difference between the, the butter I use, the grass food butter, and this here. The main difference between grass fed butter and that nutellex, which is made with you know with vegetable oil and, and and a little bit of coconut, is that my butter has two ingredients. It has milk and it has salt, and that's it. That's the only ingredients in my butter, and I'm using a grass fed butter, so I know it's coming from happy cows, 
that have been grazing on grass, which is what they should be eating instead of eating, um, you know, grain and stuff like that. It's not their natural diet. They're eating grass. But the other wonderful thing is I chose an organic grass-fed butter as well. So I know it's going to be even better for me. Whereas this product here has, let's just have a bit of a quick go at it. Okay, this product here has vegetable oil, only 4% coconut oil, by the way, even though it's got a big sign that says made with coconut oil. Um, there's water, there's salt, there's emulsifiers, there's sunflower, lecithin, there's natural flavor, vitamins D, E, natural color, beta carotin. All in there, whereas my butter is milk and salt. That's got to be better for me, right? I reckon it is. Just remember this, guys. Just because it may say vegan on the packet does not mean it's necessarily health better for your health. Because let's be honest, white table sugar, that's vegan. White flour that you used to make muffins, that's vegan. So just because it says vegan does not mean it's necessarily better for your health. So, and if you're vegan, of course you're going to choose the vegan over the, over the cow's butter. But if you're doing it because you think it's healthier for you, that is not necessarily the case. So just be aware that because a product has, like this one has, you know, made with coconut oil. There's only 4% coconut oil in there, by the way, which is kind of pretty crap, let's be honest. They sh I mean, 4%, that means that 96% is made with vegetable oils. And vegetable oils are not that good for us at all. So just be aware of those sort of, you know, those marketing ploys that these guys do to get us sucked in. All right, back to sauce. I'm more excited about sauce. Look at that. We have got a lovely little sauce going on here. It's looking pretty good. My, It's smooth. It's silky. It is silky. But we haven't finished. We need to start adding some flavor. If we were to taste that now, you will be probably a little bit bored, to be honest, with the flavor that's currently in there. We need to do a little bit of work to improve that flavor. So the way that we're gonna do that, I'm gonna put that to the side. I only bought that to show you guys. I've never used that, just so you know. I just want to show you guys that there is an option, just in case we have some people who wanna create vegan, like they absolutely cannot do any dairy. There is an option, just choose the healthiest one that you can find, always read the labels. I'm just gonna put that to the side. Like literally, that'll probably, I'll give that away to a vegan, but I don't think I'm gonna use it. All right, I'm just gonna turn my sauce down. If I can, turn it down, turn it down, nice and low, nice and low, just turn it down, nice, so it just kind of just ticks over there. The thing when you're making a white sauce is that normally at this time you would also have to um, allow it to cook out for about 30 minutes. The reason why you do that, I've moved to a spoon as you can see, the reason why you do that is because you want to get rid of the raw flour taste, but because we're using gluten free flour, you don't have to worry about cooking it out for 30 minutes. So all I'm doing with it on a very low temperature is literally just keeping it warm. That's all I'm doing. So I'm happy there. Let's add some flavor. I'm gonna put that vegan cheese to the side. And the way that we can add flavor, <gasps> this way, my tiny jar of <laughs> sugar-free mustard. Isn't it small? Gosh, I need a new one. As you can see, I really like sugar-free mustard. So um, this Dijon mustard that I love, uh, available at all, pretty much all good supermarkets, you wanna add, start by adding just a teaspoon to begin with, because when it comes to the sauce, it's really gonna come down to your flavor preferences as well. So we're just gonna stir that in. We are also gonna add some uh, yeast flakes as well. And yeast, our nutritional yeast, tastes and smells like cheese. It's wonderful. So I'm gonna start off with a couple tablespoons of our nutritional yeast, just putting it into a bowl. I'll show you why in a second. A couple of tablespoons. And then to our nutritional yeast, I'm gonna add just a little bit of hot water. Doesn't have to be boiling. It can just be hot from the kettle. And I'm just gonna add in a tablespoon of water. Oops. And then what that's gonna do is it's gonna help to just kind of dissolve the flakes, can you see? Which means it's going to blend in a lot more smoother into our wonderful sauce that we have there. So, bit of cheese flakes. Obviously, if you are vegan, this is completely vegan as well. In fact, I'm pretty sure the mustard is too. I haven't checked, but I'm pretty sure there's no animal products in our mustard. So we scrape that in. The nutritional yeast is gonna even help with the color a little bit. It's gonna make it just that little bit more uh, 
deeper in color as you can see which is wonderful and it's also going to help with the flavor because the flavor of nutritional yeast oh, i just adore it all right looking good let's think about seasoning at this point in time as well so seasoning very very important we're going to start with a pinch or two of our mineral salt give that a stir in you're noticing i'm stirring in after every ingredient and if you want to, a little grinding of black pepper as well can go in there. Give it a bit of a stir. Our sauce is looking fabulous. Still, look at that. Smooth as the days. That's what we're after. Okay. Time for probably the most important part of this sauce creation journey is the taste test because you need to know what's happening inside that pot. Right now, hmm, that's actually not bad. <laughs> I haven't even added the cheese. It's already pretty good. Oh, I just had one more, I doubled it, I know. It's all right, <laughs> I'll try it again. Hmm. That's quite yummy, but let's make it yummier. So I have in my bowl here, as you can see, very finely grated, so it just, it melts in really easy, rather than sticking in a whole block and then waiting for it to melt. I have 100 grams, which is 3.5 ounces of a very well-aged vintage cheddar. Now the reason I'm using a well-aged vintage cheddar can be described as a very sharp flavor, which is good because it's going to help to give our sauce a wonderful richness and a fullness. But the other reason why I'm, and there's only 100 grams, I know it looks like a lot more, but there's only 100 grams because I so finely grated it. Um, but the reason why I like to use a good aged cheese, which is like a hard cheese, like a cheddar, is that it's so incredibly beneficial for our gut bacteria. And we need to feed our gut bacteria with food that it basically likes to thrive on. And a good aged cheese, like a Parmesan cheese, or an aged cheddar, or an aged gouda, all those types of hard, older cheeses are really, really good for our gut bacteria. So that's why I'm choosing this cheese. And by the way, what is this cheese made out of? Look what we have. This cheese, there's three ingredients in my cheese. So there is milk, there is salt, and there is rennet, which is what causes a cheese to kind of mature and hold together. So um, there's not a lot of things going on in my aged cheddar, right? Let's take a look at the uh, vegan cheese, shall we? So this is um, grated mature cheddar style. Obviously it's, not, it's vegan and it's soya free if, if you don't want to have too much soy in your diet. But what's actually in here, remember? Three ingredients, oh four cultures as well. Four ingredients. This has got water, coconut oil, modified potato starch, maize starch, oat fiber, uh, modified maize starch thickeners, two types of thickeners, salt, natural flavorings, acidity regulators, blah, 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 blah. Yeast extract color uh, keratins. That's what's in there. This has got four ingredients, milk, salt, um, rennet and cultures, and then of course time to mature. And as the cheese matures, what happens is the lactose that's naturally occurring in milk, which a lot of us are a, um, find as an intolerance or, or have an allergy towards lactose, what actually happens during that aging process, and this one's been aged for 24 months, this cheese, is that lactose naturally begins to subside and so for myself who is lactose intolerant i get no bloating no sore belly none of that stuff that i normally get with normal milk cow's milk because the lactose quantity or quality is no longer present thanks to that aging process so that's why we go for an aged cheese but if you're vegan of course you might want to choose something along those lines there as well so i'm going to put that off to the side i'll probably be giving that one away too i just bought that to show you guys <laughs> all right so this is good there's only a few more things left to do on our sauce and then we can start talking about vegetables so i'm having another taste oh yeah yeah <laughs> and at this point in time you could be happy like me right now you could be a happy camper just like me pretty content that your cheese sauce is fabulous but you might go you know what i want to add a little bit more mustard or I want to add a little bit more yeast, or maybe even a little bit more salt or pepper. 
I'll leave it up to you guys. That's why it's so important that you go over and you taste and you taste and you taste so that you know what's happening flavor-wise before you serve it up. So, as I was saying, I'm happy with that cheese sauce. I'm just gonna leave it there. We need to get on to the next area when it comes to our incredible uh, loaded fries and what sort of vegetables are we gonna be roasting with today. So, in my bowl of goodness here, I have a collection of vegetables that some you may go, yeah, I'll roast that, but I'm hoping others you might go, I never even knew you could roast that. I had no idea. So the first one that we've got here, obviously zucchini, zucchini fries, zucchini chips, you know that those work in the oven pretty good, so we're gonna be doing something with that, with our zucchini, I'll put there, with our zucchini. Um, I also have, this may be a bit surprising, have you ever roasted spring onions or green onions, whatever you wanna call them? These are fabulous, and they look really cool because they come out really nicely as chips. So we're gonna be uh, roasting off some spring onions as well. I also have, this is a little bit of uh, sweet or rutabaga, a little bit because I've already roasted half. <laughs> so that's rutabaga, that makes really, really nice, um, nice fries. I have, of course, a beautiful, oh, half an eggplant because I've already roasted the other half. Eggplant makes incredible roasted vegetables. You probably already knew that one. Here's some other little sneaky things. Have you ever roasted a radish? I hated radishes growing up. I thought they were just, they were mean. I honestly thought they were, they were put on my plate to, to torment me, because um, I was so peppery, right? Roasted, they're sweet, they're glorious. And look at the size of them. I just got these yesterday. They were so, how could I not get a couple of radishes? So radishes are really good to roast. We'll be doing that. Asparagus is very good to roast as well. Why not roast some asparagus? You all, well, a lot of you do know how much I love roasting fennel. It is beautiful, roasted. And then this little uh, guy here, uh, which is a choco or a chayote, this roasted is probably my favorite thing at the moment. Like, I'm, I'm eating as many chocos or chayotes as I can find. They're so incredibly good for us. Extremely low carb. Obviously, you know, it's a vegetables with all this fiber and there's all this vitamin C in them but they taste so sweet when you roast them. So we're gonna roast off a choco or a chayote. And the last one I wanna to bring to your attention is called celeriac. So celeriac is a big uh, bulb that is um, looking pretty nasty, tasting very delicious. So we're gonna be roasting that as well. And it is easy to, to, for you to decide what vegetables you wanna roast. Literally, I suggest you just pick all these vegetables, do not go anywhere near a potato, Forget about sweet potato. Forget about all the things that you thought you knew about roasting vegetables and try what we have here because it's going to transform your life. Trust me on this. I, if someone said to me, oh, we're gonna have some roasted potato, I'd be like, well, that's a bit boring, isn't it? Because I've got all these other things that I can roast. So when it comes to cutting up anything you're doing for chips, remember, or loaded fries, just make sure you kind of cut things in all the same size. So because they're chips, I'm gonna be cutting them like, literally like chips. So that's the first thing, is you always wanna cut things in the same size. So for our zucchini, they can be like that. Um, for our, our rutabaga or our sweet, you wanna peel off the skin for a start. You know, give it a good wash and then peel off the skin and these make the most wonderful looking and wonderful tasting fries as well. So take it up your rutabaga or your swede, same thing, different names, right? Same thing. I call these sweet potato fries. Ha, I know, see what I did there? And just cut them into fry or chip sizes. This is what I'm doing here. They don't have to be perfect chips. They can be rustic chips. And a little goes a long way, by the way. So even though you'll notice that, you know, I'm only doing half a swede, once we mix all of these vegetables together, we're gonna get a couple of big roasting trays full of vegetables. So those are done like that. Now, when it comes to these guys, like seriously, it, these are, it's so incredibly easy to do. I can't believe it took me to, you know, four dec the fourth decade of my life before I ever tried one. So I was in uh, Spain a couple of years ago for an event, and it was spring onion season. They don't call them spring onions, they have a Spanish name for them. Apologies, I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, I don't know what the, what the Spanish name is, but 
but it was the season for spring onions. They were they were they were um, in abundance. So what they do is they take off all the ends. They usually cut off just the tops. You know, you still have a bit of green, but not too much. Um, and then they kept them whole like that, but heaps of them. Lots of olive oil, salt and pepper, and basically threw them on the fire. And then gave us bibs to eat these spring onions. And you eat the whole thing. It was one of the most amazing food experiences I've ever had. They were so delicious. I, I can't, like I said, I can't believe we don't do this more often with our spring onions or our green onions. So because they're going as chips, I'm just going to cut mine in just in half. Just like that. Just like that. All right, what else have we got? We have got asparagus. Asparagus already, you don't even have to do much to them. They already look like chips, right? It's fantastic. They look like fries. Take off the ends. I always keep the ends to pop in my vegetable pickle jar. I never throw those away. Keep the ends. And then, bam, just like that. Now we've got asparagus fries as well. So I'm salivating just with the rawness already. I'm like, this is going to be great. All right, I'm going to talk about um, the chayote now because I know it's one that um, for some of you, you may not be familiar with. So I'm just going to make sure my sauces look yet. Yeah, good, good, good. Um, you definitely want to peel it. Some people eat the skin. I actually find the skin to be a little bit um, tough and a little bit chewy. So you want to peel it. And if like my chayote is, is um, quite a firm one, I'm actually going to cut it first in half. You'll notice that there's a little seed in the middle. We're going to cut that out. And then rather than attempt to peel it, because like I said, it is proving to be quite a tough skinned one, I'm actually going to take my small knife and just just trim away at the outside. Some, some of them are really easy to peel, um, but some of them are really not. <laughs> and this is one of the knots. So there's nothing stopping you from taking up a little knife and just, you know, sort of trimming back. But yes, we are going to be creating chips. So you want to take out the little pip in the middle there. Just cut that free. And then cut them into chips or fries. Easy peasy. And once you start frying these or, or roasting them, oh my goodness, they are just absolutely phenomenal. Like, Seriously, they come up so incredibly sweet. And it was really surprising because growing up, I used to think uh, chayote or chocos were, well, basically for me, they were missiles because they're the things that I would throw at my brothers. They grow on vines and we would pick them off our neighbor's, <laughs> our neighbor's vine because she, she could never eat them all. So they would just fall on the ground and go rotten. So for me and my brothers, these were missiles. These were, this was ammunition. We were chasing each other around the neighborhood. And then mum, mum, you know, bless her, had one method of cooking um, choco, and that was just to boil them. And that was it. And, and I reckon had she known that roasting them created the most sweetest little gems of goodness, her life would have been altered. And so would have mine, because I would no longer be throwing them at my brothers. I'll be taking them inside for her to cook up. So you can sort of see we've got the same sort of shapes, same sizes. That's amazing. Like that is amazing. Like literally, guys, it's amazing. Um, I know I have seen them on special, not in the supermarket, in the veggie shop. They're super expensive in the supermarket. They were, you know, three bucks a kilo in the veggie shop at the moment. So off to our celeriac. Um, if I wanted to describe what celeriac tastes like. The best way, it's, it's kind of the the, 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 um, the the idea of what it tastes like is hidden, not really that hidden, in the name. So celeriac tastes like celery. It really, really does. And best way to peel this guy is with your little sharp knife and just running down the edges. But one of the things that I really adore about celeriac is that, you know, um, don't judge a book by its cover. It's not attractive to look at. It's ugly. But oh my gosh, it tastes good. It tastes so good. And when it roasts, it's not as strongly celery flavored, um, but it does have a natural sweetness to it. It's well balanced because celery has actually got a, got a natural almost sodium quality to it. So it is really, really delicious. And once again, cut them into chips. You can also eat, um, celeriac's really cool. You can eat it raw. There's a really famous salad called a remoulade, uh, made, made with a remoulade sauce, sorry. And it uses raw, um, very finely sliced 
celeriac and it's delicious. You can also do raw chayote as well and put that into a salad, cut it up really small. But we're roasting today. So that's that one. Um, very quickly, I'm just gonna cut a bit of eggplant so you can kind of see the sizes. Eggplant, once again, one of my favorite vegetables. I mean, everything's kind of my favorite at the moment. I'm just absolutely in love with diversity. I'm in love with all these flavors. I mean, just look what we've got here. And normally if you're roasting veg, you're probably just popping a few potatoes and some sweet potatoes into a, into a roasting tray. But look at what we have created on our little chopping board, just like this, right? It is so incredibly flavorsome and your taste buds will be on just jumping for joy. All right, once again, very quickly, I'm just gonna show you, um, it's a bit hard to make radishes into chips, I have found. So um, depending on the size of your radish, you just probably just want to do something like that. And it kind of looks cool because you've got all these colors, right? You're eating, you're roasting all these amazing colors, which is very awesome. So there's that one. And last but absolutely not least, oh gosh, this is on special at the moment. Um, I picked up this for $1.50. Oh, so happy, so happy when I found this for $1.50. All right, fennel's easy to make into chips. Once again, if we were to describe the flavour, kind of tastes a little bit in its raw state. It's a bit aniseedy or licorice um, which can be a little bit offensive. You see how it just breaks naturally, Oops, breaks naturally into chips, it's easy. Um, for some people, they do find the flavour to be a bit overwhelming. Once you roast it, it just becomes lovely and sweet and gorgeous. And it takes on all the flavours of you know the seasoning that you've put on top of it or whatever it is you've used before it goes into the roasting tray. So as you can see, we have the most delicious collection of things to roast, which you may not normally even consider a possibility. And it's just wonderful. So the next thing to do is to think about adding some seasoning to it. My favorite way to add seasoning is I grab myself up a bowl. And we do this in the restaurants. And so it, it's, the, it's not just the quickest way, but it's also the most effective way to season something. So. The um, vegetable goes in. I'm gonna actually, I mean, I could, I could literally do these together. Yeah, I'll do, I'll do those two together, just to make it faster. So I'm kind of doing all the same seasoning. So put those in. You wanna add a little bit of oil or fat. Now you could either add a coconut oil or a ve extra virgin olive oil oil <laughs> or an avocado oil. Those are the three I suggest. You wanna stay away from vegetable oils. Remember, toxic, toxic. Uh, I'm using a spray because I'm getting a really light coverage. So I'm using a bit of coconut oil spray. You can sort of see by that shaking, you know you're getting a bit of salt. Really well mixed. This is where you can become salt bay and salt from a distance. Like that. I've got my roasting tray on the back as you can see. So I'll put that down there. Let's take our celeriac. It is the same thing, but you don't just have to add, I'll put these, these two together, yeah. You don't just have to add oil of course, but definitely add seasoning. You could also, if you wanted to, think of sticky sauce. You could completely stay away from oil if you so wanted to. And as you know, in my sticky sauce, there's so many amazing flavors to help roasting, including garlic and ginger and lime and apple and, and tamari. So already, you could do something like that, right? Easy, give it a toss. You're not wasting, you're not, everything's completely coated. That's why the bowl, it's really important that we have the little bowl here. We literally call this a chip bowl in the restaurants. Because if we're doing chips from the fryer, that's how we season them. Right, so just lay them out into your roasting tray. And just very quickly, we'll do those ones as well. I'll put those separately. I do like to add sticky to my eggplant because eggplant is very sucky and, and uh, as in it's spongy, not as in it sucks, but it's just, it's really spongy and it does um, soak up all the flavors. So adding sticky to eggplant and just a little bit of coconut oil or extra virgin olive oil or avocado oil is really gonna help with the salt. You could add pepper as well. And then onto the roasting tray it goes. So you get my drift, right? These are gonna be, get the same treatment. Those there are gonna get the same treatment, the fennel and the radish, everything gets tossed. And, and a lovely you know, coconut oil, or olive oil, or avocado oil, bit of seasoning, or some sticky sauce, or both. And then your tray 
I've got a bit of baking paper there just to help with the cleaning. The, the, the main secret when you are roasting any type of vegetable is you want to do things in a single layer. Because when it has a single layer, there is time for it or the opportunity for it to caramelize on the base of the pan, which is really, really important, because then you get a lovely caramelization happening. But it, you don't get a stewed chip or a stewed fry by overloading. And if, you know, if things aren't in a single layer, this might cook on the bottom, but let's just say I had them all kind of stacked up like this, right, like that. The ones under the bottom will probably get a little bit caramelized, but the ones in the middle will just be soggy, and the ones on the top will only cook on top, and the bottom will be soggy. That's why I always say, whenever you're roasting anything, don't overload your roasting trays. You may have to do a couple of roasting trays, which obviously I will have to do, because those vegetables need their own space. They're very, they're very space conscious. Think of this like social distancing your vegetables on your roasting tray, so that they all have the opportunity to roast evenly. So this tray and any other tray that you might have got, gets popped into the oven and it's gonna roast in a hot oven set at 210 degrees, which is about 420 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's gonna roast for about 30 minutes to 45 minutes, depending on the vegetable. And you can just go along, you can say, actually, you know what? All my eggplants are done, I'm gonna take all my eggplants out, I'm gonna take my, my uh, chayote out, actually chayote do take a bit more time, zucchini's done. So that's what I tend to do, is I actually keep the vegetables in their section, so I'll put all the eggplant together, put all the uh, chayote together, put all the zucchini together, so when one vegetable's ready, I will literally just take some tongs, take them out and keep on cooking the rest. So it's gonna take, like I said, about 30 minutes to 45 minutes for your vegetables to roast in that really, really hot oven. And what do we have at the end? Oops, oopsie. End of our journey. Here's some I prepared earlier. Dun, 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 dun. This little tray here. That's actually quite a decent sized tray. There is a number of vegetables that I have on here, including our asparagus. This is our eggplant chips. We have our, um, our radish as well. Where are we? Somewhere. Oh, fennel. What else? Uh, this, I, I wanna show you guys the celeriac. The celeriac comes out as a really nice chip. Celeriac's really good. And as does the sweet or the rutabaker as well. So hot together, put it all onto a tray, give it a bit of a mix up. Remember it's loaded fries. So what do we do with loaded fries? Is number one, is we take our cheese sauce, and I'm actually gonna be putting it into a, a little gravy boat so we can pour it on top. We take our cheese sauce, we put that on the side. You can also think about doing something like this. In this jug here, I have my homemade tomato ketchup. I have to make it in quantities this much because Coco loves it. So this is my homemade tomato ketchup. That is going to go in there just like that. So that is amazing. But what is stopping you from taking, I just have some little toasted cumin seeds and there's a little bit of fennel seeds in there, a little bit of sesame seeds, and we're just gonna sprinkle that at the top. Remember, it's loaded. So this is where you're gonna go a little bit crazy and add as many wonderful things as you want to. Of course, we can't forget just a little bit of salt. We can't forget just a little bit of pepper. You could add nutritional yeast to the top of these right now. Give that a bit of a sprinkle. You could do something like this. Let me just move that off to the side. Excuse me. Excuse me. Take some fresh herbs. And you could also consider just taking some fresh herbs and sprinkling them on top as well because this is not only going to be a color sensation as you can see, you're getting a wonderful color in there, but you're adding even more flavor. You're loading it up. And I have finished. Why not? Take that little bit of cheddar and then just give it a wonderful grating of finely, you finely grated cheese. Just so you don't even need much. It's, I probably haven't even added sort of 15 grams of cheese here, like half an ounce. It's all of, not even that, probably only 10 grams, like a third of an ounce of cheese can get grated over the top too. You could also, this is amazing, trust me on this. I've just got coconut yogurt. You could either just like, you could like do that with a coconut yogurt, but I actually like to mix my coconut yogurt just into the tomato sauce. I'm just putting a couple of big dobs of it in there and kind of mixing it through 
and making it look kinda kinda yummy and delicious. That can get done. And the last thing I'm gonna think about adding, I've got a little bit more of that spring onion. So why not? Just a few little rounds of spring onion can go on top too. And what you literally have is you have just the most delicious tray of goodness possible. Let's just very gently, cheese sauce time, a little bit, oh my goodness, oh gosh, wow. <laughs> there you go guys. And look at that tomato sauce. Oh, it's so delicious, it's so incredibly good. I um I probably don't have to let you guys know what we intend to be having for lunch, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's gonna be a bit of a, a bit of chip eating, fry, loaded fry eating happening in our house in a very short amount of time. So thank you so much for joining me today. I will be sharing this recipe with you guys tomorrow on Bridget's Healthy Kitchen. If you would like to request the PDF, come see me tomorrow on Bridget's Healthy Kitchen. Keep an eye out on your um, on your Facebook feed. We'll be posting up the recipe so you can download it and then you can. Try all these wonderful vegetables. Look at the ball. You can try that incredible cheese sauce. Um, if you would like a copy of my homemade tomato ketchup, which is mm, so good, and of course it's sugar free and all nasty free, I will also add a link to that recipe um, in the post tomorrow on Bridges Healthy Kitchen so you can request that one as well. So it's been very wonderful spending the afternoon with you. Please, everyone, stay well, stay safe, and I will see you next time right here in Bridget's Healthy Kitchen. Bye guys!